going. <laughs> Thank you very and, much. Okay, anyway, we're, we're thrilled. We are absolutely thrilled that we have the participants here and we are so happy to be able to, to talk to you guys about screenwriting, okay? Because it's what, it's what we do, all right? All right, Thank Roger. You. Okay. Over to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye now. Okay, well, um, at first I have to say it's just a, it's a little it's it's a little odd just sort of speaking without seeing faces, but uh, I'll just have to use my imagination. Yeah, so we we titled this masterclass uh, "Why Story Matters," and I guess you know I'm not really here to tell you why it matters, but maybe just to explore why why it does to various people in various ways so much of our existence, you know, and society and systems and all of that depend on story. If you think about it, it's just pervasive in, in our existence. You know, all religions are based on stories. Uh, our, our monetary, the money, the idea of money is really a story that we have just kind of bought into and, and it's a shared belief. But I guess what's maybe more interesting than talking about why it matters is to talk about you know what it what it means to us and i guess that's that's part of the same thing you know since the ages in the early you know since language essentially i i think we've always had these questions about existence why are we here what are we doing and we've come up with explanations and those explanations even before science were based on stories and and myths and, and all of that and it gives us a sense of our place in the world. And it allows us, you know, stories allow us to, to frame everything, really. Our whole, our, whole, our whole experience, past, present, and future, is always shaped in, you know, either fact and or fiction. And because it's such a, you know, mystery really about life, I think the big things that we all have in common are, are the questions. And that's really what story does, I think, is explore questions, explore, you know, the human existence, what we're all about, and what matters to us, our, our shared values. But how do we express all of this? Because it's so kind of ethereal or, or vague and, and broad. How, how do we actually explore concepts and ideas um, Within a, within a story framework. What is that framework? Michael mentioned earlier on that, you know, what we tend to do at the film school is, is demystify. Now I can't see hands here, but I'm just wondering, uh, you guys will know if you've written before, the, the, the key thing I think is as a writer is to have something to say. That's probably the most important thing, unless you're just a, a writer for hire and they, someone's telling you what to write and then you type it up. That's, that's a whole different thing. But I think every writer has to have like multiple opinions about you know, you know, their, their perspective on life. And what are we, I boil it down to two things, I think as a writer, to what are we, you know, why would anybody wanna write or read what we're writing? So it's gotta be relatable, but what are we criticizing? And what are we celebrating? And I think it really boils down to those two things as a writer. What are we, you know, um, if, if we're criticizing greed and selfishness, then we're probably also celebrating generosity and, and charity and, and, and compassion. And I think be, when we start to talk about story, what we're doing is we're talking about the nature's way, nature's law, the, the, the progression of everything in life as, as we know it, right? Everything has a beginning, it works through the middle and it comes to the end. So in terms of making sense of story, I think we have to make sense of the pattern and rhythm of life itself, you know? We begin at a very young age, you know, as, as infants, and if we're lucky, we grow to be old and then we'll die. So born uh, and, and, and die. Those are two polarities that form the binary poles, I think, of all dramatic sort of uh, progression. Now, you know, that's when we're talking about broad, broad uh, span of time here, which is an entire life. When we're talking about drama, we have to really compress and condense 
it into whatever format we're, we're working in. If you're writing a novel, for example, there's no real limitation on, uh, if it's too short, it'll be a novella or a short story, but you can write an 800 page novel and um, that's not a problem. The author has a lot more freedom and doesn't have to really kind of adhere to the sort of conventions, uh, expectations in the industry. But where those expectations come from is an appreciation that drama has a structure that isn't coming out of Hollywood. It's not coming out of screenplay books. It's coming out of, of it comes, comes from writers, I think, who were consciously or unconsciously tapping into nature's way, which is that things move ahead through time, right, in a, in a linear fashion. So I'm not, let me put it this way. What I'm going to be talking about today are, are just one man's sort of perspective. You don't have to believe anything that I, I say. What's important, though, if it makes sense to you, then, then you can process that to see how it fits into your perspective, broader perspective. Hopefully, I'll just point out some things that are, are kind of obvious, because it's not as tricky as it may seem, even though like we have 100 and some odd pages to write a story. When we're talking about screenplays, feature length screenplays, we do have to realize that we can't write an 800 page screenplay. So if you're writing a spec screenplay, you sort of have to imagine your story in a 100 page span of time. So, you know, roughly 100 minutes. And then it's a matter of what can you manage effectively and dramatically within that time span and the, that page count. It's a little bit like if you're a painter, what's the size of your canvas? You know, if it's huge, then you have to think a little bigger. If it's just really small postcard style stuff, that's, that is a whole different set of criteria for uh, accomplishing what you're intending to do. So I'm gonna really, my specialty is, is feature uh, writing uh, screenplay. So the, the spec screenplay where you write it because you have something to say and then you send it out and hope someone will will buy it or produce it. But where is you know structure come from? I mean, there's as you know, there's a million screenwriting books out there, and you know it's worthwhile reading them. But pretty much everyone's saying the same thing because it's it's not that complicated, and it it basically begins a story begins in the middle or or rather at the beginning set something up so that we have expectations and then we find out whether or not you know things will work out kurt vonnegut kind of summed it up really nicely he said this is this is seems to be a, a popular kind of story somebody gets into trouble and then they get out of trouble people seem to like that story so it's it's not that complicated and the, and i think the big thing to remember is that we live structure all the time in our daily existence, in our relationships. If you think back, any endeavor that you've participated in has a beginning. It was when that idea, oh, you know what? I think I'd like to run a marathon or man, I really need a vacation. And so that's the beginning. We do that all the time. We meet somebody for the first time and say, oh, you know, I kind of like them. It'd be nice to you know, establish a friendship or a relationship and then the uh, that relationship develops and then you know it could conclude in you know either a, a, a breakup a, a fight uh, with a difference of opinions or it could result in a union where that relationship is concluded with a significant event i.e uh, you know moving in together or a, or a marriage proposal or a wedding but you think about it every day we're going through you know you plan to build a woodshed because you know there'd be a need for uh, storing wood, and then it's like, okay, I need to build a woodshed. Well, that's the inciting incident in in a story, right? So even outside of the realm of Hollywood and screenwriting, just think about all the things that you do that has a dramatic structure, and that's the basis of screenwriting, I think, or any dramatic writing. What is it that the character wants to do, and that's the hook, you know? If you and why do they want it? Motive is really important. Say you're you're working as a data entry clerk in a, you know, veal fattening pan at some big corporation, 
and you're just burnt out. You feel like you need a break. Well, if this were a story about somebody finding their their passion, we need to set up uh, a scenario where the audience can recognize here's somebody that's in kind of a dead end job and they're frustrated. And then maybe the to get the ball rolling, someone comes along, maybe it's a, a supervisor or a friend that says, you know, you need to, to take a vacation and, and sort things out. You're a little burnt out. So just that little bit of, of action or business could take about 10 pages in a screenplay. Who is the character? What do they want? And what do they need? And how are they going to go about getting it? It's just, it's, it's that kind of simple thing that when you're writing a story, you just draw on your own experience. You know, um, any new adventure. I always say to the students who, who come into the uh, the program, it's like you kind of entered, you're in your at the beginning of the second act now. And if you think wherever, whatever school that you're in, you know, prior to going to school, and you're thinking about going to school and finding out what you need to do to apply and then applying to school and then waiting to find out if you're accepted in school. That's all act one stuff, right? And it's all those events that are germane to that one particular pursuit. In his, in his poetics, Aristotle's poetics is talking about, you know, a life can be a story, but there's so many sort of chapters or episode in every life that you can't possibly manage that effectively in a you know a, a limited framework. So you have to kind of isolate particular events, i.e., chapters, and then dramatize those chapters, that event, that particular you know goal, with a with a beginning and with a middle and with an end. And so, you know, and, and in that first act, we're introduced to the character and, and you know, uh, ideally that the, um, the writers will give that character something that's of interest to us, something that we can relate to as well. So really your act one is identifying a problem or a need or a goal. And then that you have to figure out fancy, not fancy, but, you know, compelling, fun, dramatic ways of introducing us to this world and making it clear for the audience what what the character wants, what they need, what kind of trouble they're in, and then to establish the next question is how are they going to? What's the solution? How are they going to get out of this, or how are they going to achieve it? And that's pretty much your second act is watching them strive to achieve the goal, and then ultimately the third act and the climax they will either achieve the goal or they will fail, but learn something sort of fundamental to them understanding that they didn't really need what they wanted. And so there'd be some kind of change in the, in the character. And this is important because I think one of the things that a lot of stories do, especially character-driven stories, is they celebrate the possibility of change. And I'm going to get a little bit of feels a little bit philosophical here but that seems to be that's the constant in in life right everything changes and so drama reflects that as well that um you know as i said earlier we're born and when we're young we you know uh don't know a lot and over the years we gain experience we get a job training education uh we have all these things to draw on that expand our, our experience really and, and allow us to process it and then at the end we'll be able to look back over our lives and make sense of things when you're young you're looking ahead so it's all based in that kind of natural progression of moving ahead towards change even if you know there's not a significant change one gets older one you know his hair uh, becomes white and um yeah, uh, hopefully that one can draw on experience and then sometimes get a new perspective into things about what's important and not. And that's one of the things I think about writing that's so, so much fun is it allows the writer to explore life and to draw on her own experiences about what this writer wants to celebrate. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Right. It's sometimes I think it's more about validating the ordinary in terms of that we celebrate kindness 
compassion, generosity, and will criticize cruelty, you know, arrogance, selfishness, and, and greed. At least, you know, if you wanted to argue the other way that greed is good too, that's that's a that's a thesis, right? That's a that's a, a place to begin. But it's a value I don't think many people are going to celebrate, right? That's the kind of behavior that we tend to, to criticize. So within this structure where we begin at the beginning and work through to the end, it's like, what's the point of the story? And this is where we talk about, you know, people. This is, people almost always are the subject matter, unless it's a, a documentary on, on nature and we watch the meerkats sort of develop and socialize and all of that. But yeah, we're, the subject matter of, of all movies are, is people, really, and what people do, and what people want, and why they want it, and how they go about getting it, and do they learn a lesson? We've all had experiences, I'm presuming, right, that you know we, we thought we knew something, and then we found out that we were misinformed, or we hadn't seen a, another argument to shift our, broaden our perspective. So I think that's, for me, that's the thing that writing is all about is to explore our lives on you know the short term that we have on this planet to figure out what's of value to us what do we want to celebrate and what do we want to criticize and it doesn't have it's just a revalidation i think of a lot of these these concepts it doesn't have to be mind blowing you know like something nobody's ever thought of before because that would be so foreign it would be hard for us to to relate to and I think that's really one of the keys in, in good storytelling are characters who have problems that we go, ah, yeah, I felt like that. And it validates our own experience. And as writers, then we can take those experiences and we can turn them into drama. If, you know, it, it's uh, going to be compelling, a compelling storyline. Stories about, you know, struggling to achieve something celebrates the, uh, the, the process, you know, the, the determination, the dogged determination to, to get something instead of just giving up. So, for example, if that's something that you wanted to celebrate, a lot of the answers to the, the questions of how do I begin the story become self-evident based on, on these polarities. Everything, as I, I, my big point is that everything as far as I've been able to figure out anyway, it has an opposite value. You think about you're young, the opposite is old. You're, you're ignorant or you're learned. You know, you're um, incapable, you're capable. You're, it's, it's dark, it's light. It's hot, it's cold. Um, it's long, it's short. There's good, there's evil. There's uh, happy, there's sad. All of these, these, these binary positions really give you the poles for your story. And it, the story is determined by where you are at the beginning. One of my favorite examples is, is, is A Christmas Carol. We're coming up to Christmas time. I, I just assume most people are aware of Ebenezer Scrooge. But if you're not, it doesn't really matter because this is the story about somebody who's just a nasty guy. He's miserly, he, he's uh, greedy, um, he's antisocial. He's just not a nice, nice guy. So the beginning of, of Dickens' Christmas Carol is to introduce us to this character and show us that he's nasty. And so what's the opposite of nasty? Well, it's nice, right? You go, so the storyline is about a guy who goes from being nasty to nice because it celebrates, you know, the, the value of, of being nice. And, and the consequences of, of being nasty. That's it, that's the story, that's what it's about. How it happens and unfolds is where the plot comes in. So the plot is not the story, the plot helps you tell the story. So this is where at the beginning I say, as a writer, we have to know what we're trying to say. And it's not like, you know, a mathematical equation or anything like that. It's just simple validation of universal truths as, as we generally accept as decent human beings, right? So Dickens came up with the, this notion that over the course of one night, Ebenezer Scrooge will be visited by three ghosts, the ghosts of Christmas past, of Christmas present, and Christmas future. And over that course of the night, we get flashbacks of how he used to be, 
so that you know we realize he wasn't always nasty but he turned sour through certain circumstances so that he does have uh, redemptive possibilities i guess then as the story moves on you know through the ghosts of christmas present we sort of get a more understanding of the, the world that he's in at the moment and then the ghost of christmas future shows him his grave and that no one would come to see his grave no one would come no one would mourn his loss and that's when scrooge has that epiphany he's like you know i don't want to be forgotten i don't I don't want to be remembered as, as a horrible man. And then he asks the ghost, is this the way it will be or, or um, would be if I don't change? The ghost says, uh, it's how it will be if you don't change. So that sparks the, the motivation for Scrooge to buy turkeys for everybody now, help out Tiny Tim and be a good guy, demonstrably uh, being good, right? And that marks the change. And the story, I think, there is that it's better to be nice than nasty. It's better to be loved than, than hated and despised. It, life is just so much better. You sleep better. And, you know, there's so much more joy to be had if, if you spread a little instead of, you know, robbing it from people. So the, it's just some simple truths. Whatever it is that you, you feel that you want to explore, then it's the question of how are you going to do it? And that's where you start to come up with the plot that will be because that storyline from nasty to nice has been told a million times not just in retellings of, of a christmas carol but any sort of redemption tale where there's a character who's not so good and then they learn the the folly of their ways or the consequences of that negative behavior and then they change years ago and, and this is um i'm just reaching back here but there was a, a movie called american history x about a, a racist uh, character, a Nazi skinhead. And it's not celebrating, you know, uh, white supremacy, it's criticizing it. But the character has to be designed so they have somewhere to go. So if they're already a, a really good guy, where do you go with that, right? So these are just like the really simple tricks, I think, in figuring out, at least in your broad strokes, what your story's all about. Where are you going with that? And beginning with characters as opposed to in a world you know in the in the fifth dimension behind the dark star of io it's like what i i don't i can't relate to that but if there's a character in that world who's going through some issues like emotional issues or relationship issues and it just happens to be in a in an outside world then i can relate to that so this is the big thing is like figuring out before you get into the plot because it's so easy to get tangled up in plot to figure out what you're trying to say. And I think if you just put this on your computer when you're writing, what am I celebrating? What am I criticizing? That's kind of the whole, the building blocks for your story. And it kind of gives you opportunities to explore both sides of the question, right? If this is a, a character-driven redemption story, we'll be introduced to somebody who maybe has some good tendencies, but they, they give over to, you know materialism too much they just they have to have things for the sake of having them and and they don't really know why and over so they're striving for something like maybe a red sports car because it's going to make life so much better and over the course of the story certain events would happen that would allow them to realize that just material goods is not the secret and the recipe for happiness it's it's human interaction and maybe you know a, a lesser expensive car, less expensive car would do just as well, so long as there's somebody nice to ride with in in that car. So it seems it it seems pretty simple, and and it really is. Beginning again with what are you trying to say? And this is why I think story matters is because it allows us to validate our own feelings. By and large. You know, society's worked out to reflect the values of its citizens. And that's why we have, you know, police and we have justice systems, because we celebrate justice and we really, I think, hate injustice. And really, that begins, if you're thinking about your theme, it kind of gives you a, a, an inkling as to what genre that you might want to explore as well. If justice is a theme, it might be a crime drama that you're, you're working on. 
And then, you know, again, to, to figure out what the design of the story is, is like, what, are you, what are you trying to say? It does, like I said, it doesn't have to be original. It just, it, it just be a reaffirmation of something that we've already understood in this, like, you know, if, if justice is the theme, well, there's injustice or there's breaking the law and then having justice meted out so that there's a, there's a price to be paid. So essentially, the premise of almost all dra uh, crime dramas is that crime does not pay. And because you have that premise uh, very clear, you have your story already. Someone's going to commit crime. They might get away with it for a while, but at the end, they'll get caught and be punished. And the message is, oh, guess what? Crime doesn't pay. Unless, you know, you're you know, being a little more cynical and, and, you, and, and your thesis is that everything's corrupt and there are just people who are a little less corrupt. And that's that's a valid approach too, if it reflects your attitude and your and the values and philosophy. The, the big question is though, ultimately, when we're writing screenplays, not many people like curl up in front of the fire with a good screenplay. It's a good book or they'll watch a movie. So the screenplay is just a blueprint for the actual movie. But it's also um, a product really re that you're trying to sell. In fact, writing is one of the purest form of entrepreneurialism that you can get because just out of our own imaginations, and our own, you know, philosophy and all that, we, we give birth to uh, a story. And now we've got a story and now we have to try to sell that story. And it's gonna be a lot more saleable if a lot of people are going, yeah, I like that as opposed to, oh man, that's dark. I don't think, you know, the serial killers get away with it. And, you know, that's, that's just unsettling, right? So that would be a tough sell. So those are the things we really kind of, we don't really need to think from a commercial point of view, but I think we have to think about marketability. If we're writing a screenplay on spec, who's gonna put the money into it because ultimately they would like a return. So if it's, you know, not, not to be prescriptive at all, but like right now, you know, the world's uh, in, in a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of, you know, bad things going on. Is now the time to be selling a story about, you know, suicide and uh, depression and, uh, you know, where it ends tragically? Yeah. You're free to do that, of course, right? But uh, I think at, at this time, people are looking for stories that validate hope and optimism. So this is all I think part of being a writer is like looking around at the world, see what's going on and, and how that can inform your work. Because one of the things I, I wanted to talk about is making stories relevant to our times. Because, you know, we're all living in our time. So these stories about, you know, betrayal and, and or love or sacrifice and, and heroism doesn't really matter what era that's in because those are values that are still, you know, um, regarded today and are relevant to our lives. But if you're just writing a, a, a story uh, set in, in the past that the, the point of it has no bearing on what's happening in, in our world, then the story just doesn't seem that relevant to me. And again, not just actual events that are happening, but the things behind the events, like it seems like a lot of people are a lot more cynical. You know, the, the world's divided. There's, you know, um, there's, there's these huge polarities, right? There's very little middle ground these days. So that's something that might, might spark a, a story idea, like, you know, a family divided and then talk about how do we resolve conflict? And in fact, that's really another, the sine qua non of drama is conflict. And getting back to these notions of these, these polarities, if you have a protagonist, then you have the opposite value of that, which is the antagonist. And that relationship will develop into some kind of conflict, which then has to be resolved. And that's kind of a recipe of how we can move ahead, how we can come together, uh, talk about our differences and move forward.
um, without any negative repercussions. What's the story about? Where is it set? What are you trying to say? These are things, you know, worth worth thinking about. And, you know, take a take a walk. A lot of writing isn't actually about typing, right? It's about reading. It's about formulating your thoughts, jotting notes about what you're trying to say, and then finding out how you're going to say it. Who are these characters? Where do they live? What do they do? All the things that we have to work on to create characters that are compelling and um, that are going to take us somewhere in the in the story. Years ago, in the in the nineteen fifties, just uh, as to make a, an example to, to shore up my point here, uh, there was this American senator named uh, Joseph McCarthy, who. Decide, he, he realized he could get a lot of power if he created a lot of fear and established this red menace, like there's a communist under every bed, look, look out. Uh, a lot of, you know, it happened, a lot of people got blacklisted in Hollywood because, you know, they were deemed to be communists. And it was basically just the guy pointing the finger going, they're a communist, and everyone go, oh, yeah, uh, okay, if he says so, it must be true, right? And so they would just buy into something. That's happening today, especially like all around the world, but especially in the States, it seems that just accusations, statements not grounded in any kind of fact are being believed by people. So that's something to criticize, right? So Arthur Miller, who's a famous American playwright, you know, was living through that, that time. Instead of writing a story about McCarthyism though, he thought what time in history did we experience that same kind of hysteria, you know, where people are naively and uh, buying into this uh, notion that, you know, there's everyone's a communist and everyone's out to, to get everybody. He realized it was that hysteria that came about when, uh, with the Salem witch uh, trials, witchcraft trials, way back in, I think it was the 1600s. I'm not a historian, so my dates could be wrong. But it was just people could be burned to at the stake because someone pointed a finger said they walked by my my house and my cow went dry and they put a curse on it and everyone go oh she's a witch she's a witch and, and they burn her so what he was he went back in time and found another scenario that was reflected what was going on in, in the current time and he and he wrote the crucible which is a, a very famous play um and so that's you know the thing is we, we live in our times and, and this is the, our times are the, the source material for what we have to say, to be relevant, I think. But again, it doesn't have to be so topical that once that time has passed that it's no longer relevant. So if you talk about stories about love, sacrifice, those are universal, you know, back in, back in ancient Babylonia, they were writing stories. People were still, you know, having affairs. Um, they were falling in love. They were having children. You know, they were, people were getting sick. They would have a funeral. All of that stuff is, is universal. And it taps us into what it is to be a human being, I think. So these are the, the concerns that you'll have to take into consideration when figuring out what you want to write about. And some, that the writing isn't all that hard, I think. As long as you know what you're trying to do, that's the big challenge. Sometimes you go, "What? What am I trying to say here?" But once you have that clarity, and you know, I want to celebrate nice, or I want to criticize corruption. If you want to do that, you'd have somebody who's a decent person establish their world, and then they'd be tempted into getting something that they wouldn't haven't worked hard for, and then we see them do some things that they shouldn't do, be rewarded for that until the end and it crashes down because the point of the story is that you, you shouldn't embezzle or you shouldn't you know, kill your business partner or you shouldn't cheat you know, the bank or your business partner. All of that stuff gets, gets dramatized so that we can see the consequences in, in this causal progression. Um, so once, you know, you got your basic concepts down and, you know, you're, what you're trying to say, you have to consider too, though, things can evolve because it's, we can't imagine a whole story right out of the, the, the gate. 
So it takes it takes a while, it takes work, and and the story will evolve as well as as your approach evolves, and you start to figure out craft. So this is the thing where stories are connected to nature's laws, really, that there's a beginning, there's a middle and an end, we work through it, you know? And also there's all these reversals to the polar uh, opposite of, of what like happy, sad, you know, love, hate, all of those things, which basically provide your bookends for the story. Start about how does love go wrong? What happens when people get a heartbroken and become sour and bitter? And can they come out of that? Well, that's a, that's another story. Just that simply, the bigger questions are: okay, Who are these characters? Uh, where do they live? What do they do? What do they think? What informs them? What choices do are they going to make? Because we're talking about features today, you know, if you're writing a spec script nowadays, it's it behooves you to keep it around a hundred pages, I think. For one reason that if it's 120 pages, the first note is going to be it's, it's a little long and probably it is, it'll be a little too long. So keep the story kind of focused and figure out what you're working within, what the margins are really, how much room you have to dramatize things. One of the biggest issues I think a lot of beginning writers have is they try to do too much. Here's a good example, like in the 1970s, there was a movie called Three Days of the Condor. It was a really good uh, thriller story. It was adapted from a novel called Six Days of the Condor because they couldn't manage six days effectively in that time frame of a feature length. So they just cut it in half. Now it's three days instead of six. So knowing what your parameters are, I think helps you understand what choices you can make um, and what are non-starters what you what you can't what might be problematic if you pursued so your first act roughly is going to be about 25 to 30 pages so how much can you you manage i mean sometimes introducing a character in and their problem can take you 10 10 pages that's almost half of your your first act and then you need to figure out how you're going to dramatize this idea that they have like or or um, somehow tangibly manifest the, their goal and their desire and their reason for wanting it and that's that's the hook so you've got like 25 pages to introduce us to this world get us interested in the characters and to understand where the story is going that because if you don't know and it just seems like anything could happen at any time that's that's generally very problematic because there's no sense of anticipation because you don't know what to expect so this is where once we you got the, the vague kind of concepts down you start to figure out how do i dramatize this effectively and that's where craft comes in you know generally a scene you don't want to write an eight page scene that's just that's going to kind of flatline and be very static. Scenes, you know, if you watch movies, this is something to do actually. When you're watching movies, see how long the, the, the scene is. And sometimes the scene is part of a larger sequence. So it's a, it's a it can, you know, maybe 10 minutes of continuous action, but not all in one location. Things will move around because it's called movies, right? Things have, have to move. So this is where craft comes in, knowing what you, how to get into a scene, what you're trying to do in that scene, and then how to segue into that next scene with a degree of causality. Now I'm talking a lot and I, you know, you don't have to remember everything. If there's one or two things that kind of make sense, then that, that's, that's good, right? Because it's an ongoing thing, a lifelong thing talking about, um, you know, writing, creating characters, formulating your point of view as, as a writer. And, and sometimes that can change as well. But when we're applying out aspects of craft is what can we manage effectively? And if you're trying to do too much, the reader will get confused. And the trick is to make the reader curious about what's coming next. I think in life, you know, questions are always way more interesting than answers. Answers I think should always be challenged because like who really knows 
you know, I guess if, if it's math or something like that, something tangible, um, yeah, you can you can prove it. But if someone's actually just giving you an opinion, unless they can back up that opinion with, with facts, it's just an opinion and that could change. When we're writing, uh, okay, this is the other thing too, in, in writing the screenplay, we're conveying information that has to be either seen or heard. And that's, we can't really do authorial intrusions in the screenwriting that this is really what it's about. We've got to just take it at, at face value that somebody walks into a room, goes to a desk drawer, pulls out a gun. And then we're thinking, okay, who's that guy? And why do they have a gun? That raises a question. And then the door come, the door, there's a knock on the door and they put the gun away. And then someone enters the, the room, like, who is that person? And now that raises questions. So I think if the writer is aware of the questions that the audience is gonna ask, then they can provide the answer, which then can be questioned and move along. So I think the, the forward progression of a narrative is really largely based on that whole Q and A progression. If there's, you know, opening up a movie and we see, a, you know, uh, the camera's focused on one particular character walking down the street, you know, we, we make certain assumptions based on first impressions. So, okay, look, he's, he's, he's in a suit, he's a businessman, or, or, you know, she looks, she's dressed like a, like a teacher or something, probably a teacher. That the question implied there is, okay, so why should I be interested in this person? So then the writer has to provide the answer. Oh, because, you know, um, she's in this, works in this world that's really fraught at the moment. What's the problem? And then we find out the problem because that's, there's a scene or sequence that dramatizes the problem. Maybe this, we find out that the teacher's really burnt out and needs a break. And that the principal comes up and says, listen, you, you should take a, 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 some time off or, each, each little event raises the question about what's gonna happen. If she's told she needs a vacation, then the question is where is she gonna go? What kind of vacation will she take? And then we find that she's at the travel agent. We find out she's going to uh, Guanajuato or um, Puebla, or I'm just thinking some of the places I've been to in, in Mexico. And, and then what's gonna happen when they, they get there? And how is that gonna to relate to the problem that was established? If you've got too much going on, the questions get lost and we get confused. So this is why simplicity is really, really key. And even if your first draft of a screenplay ends up being, you know, like 65 or 70 pages, it's like, that's a little bit short. Chances are what you already have just needs to be developed a little bit more. And that, gives you that room to expand the story as opposed to if you've written your first draft and it's 130 pages, you're gonna to have to be cutting things out. So keep in mind that Three Days of the Condor adapted from a novel called Six Days of the Condor. The best adaptations for movies are generally adapted from a short story because there's less plot involved. And it gives us time to dramatize and validate the ordinary. And that's the thing, you got to pick your moments in the story to be relevant to the theme and what you're, you're trying to say. A story without a good theme is, is in my experience, uh, is going to be problematic. Because, again, knowing what you're, you're trying to say, what your theme is, will inform a lot of your choices. And it'll keep, you know, the, the story a little simpler, but also richer and uh, you know thematically rich and then you can start to employ you know really compelling image systems that reflect the larger theme uh, in your second so you your first act is your setup really right uh, you're introducing us to the characters and establishing the question that we're that's going to sustain our curiosity and then once that's introduced in the what we would call the ordinary world of the story we move into the second act. As I was saying earlier, um, back in the days when students were in the, in the classroom, um, I would say you're at the beginning of your second act of this little journey that's uh, uh, all about film school. 
And the goal that everybody has if they come to film school and the writing program is to become better writers and to uh, develop their, their, their chops. And Claudia, uh, how about for time? I, I, not too bad? Oh, okay. Still sorry. good for time? Lost my connection, sorry. Okay, so I'm okay for time? Okay, yeah, thank you. okay so um, moving into, once the, the world of the story has been established and we move into the second act, the question is now is, okay, how, how are they going to achieve what, what they're striving to achieve? And what are the obstacles uh, and complications that they're going to have to endure? And this is again where craft comes in. Instead of just having people wandering around being passive and things happening to them, it's always better if they're striving for them themselves, doing things, overcoming things uh, that reveal aspects of their, their, their character. There are two things to do in every scene is to reveal character and to advance the plot. So this is where a lot of the, the writing work isn't actually the writing, it's figuring out who the character is, what defines them in a simple way. Uh, and that their behavior comes becomes somewhat predictable or revealed in the choices that they make, how they deal with with struggle and and how you know um, complications affect their journey and how they're able to adapt to that. Again, it's it's, it's exploring humanity and, and human behavior. Um, generally speaking, there's a at the end of the second act, there's a there's a low point. And I'm sure we've, we've all been there too, where it's, you know, things are looking really good and then something happens and it's not working out as we expected. That's like a dramatic reversal. That again happens all the time in ordinary life. In fact, everything that happens in ordinary life is the basis, I think, of, of a lot of the craft in story writing. We've all had like expectations. Okay, you're going out to a party tonight. It's going to be really, really great. And then you get to the party and you find out it, oh, it was last night, you missed it. Oh, there's, so that's a disappointment. So there's this big positive ex expectation and then a negative payout. And that, that little sequence has had some movement and it's gone somewhere and ends at the opposite value of how it began. But maybe in that storyline, they meet somebody at the, at the house and now strike up a, a relationship. And that's a causal sort of uh, repercussion of that one particular event. And so that negative event turns into a positive event because you know, they make a, a date for the next day. That's all part of craft. And if you have too much going on, it sort of minimizes your opportunity to get into the story, figure out who these characters are, how they'll react and what you're trying to say with the story as well. So that's, you know, the key is that, that sharp focus. If, you're, if your character is nasty, it seems to be the obvious choice that the, the plot will facilitate them becoming nice or dealing with the consequences of not changing. A lot of stories like this that celebrate the possibility of change, right? In real life, it seems a lot of people don't change, you know, and you know, that, that's, that's sometimes disappointing, uh, but it, and sometimes it ends badly for the characters as well, or, you know, for people that they don't change, you know, they, they don't maybe have the opportunities that they would if they became a nicer person. But, you know, your, your story trajectory is kind of determined by who your character is at the very beginning. I always say that, you know, of course, it, it's a, it's an individual work, from the writer and the writer's mind, what the, the writer's trying to say. But once you've got the story going, you've got the setup, you've got the character introduced, the story starts to dictate where it wants to go. If you employ these basic principles of polarity and dramatic structure. So it doesn't have to be that complicated. If you've got a character who's in debt at the very beginning, what's the opposite of that? They'll get out of debt, right? How are they gonna do that? That's the story. Maybe they decide to rob a bank. They get arrested, but it's the first offense. Then they write a book about it. It's turned into a movie, and now they're they, you know that that's not the greatest idea, but that that's how it can work. So the the end is always inherent in the beginning. 
if uh, yeah, people are in a, in a, in trouble, they get out of trouble. If they're not in trouble, they get into trouble and then they can get out of trouble again. And so the writer, I think, becomes a servant to the story, what the story needs. If you understand aspects of craft and where you need to go with the story. And it's just a whole bunch of random ideas that are seem really cool or that would be a cool shot is like the last thing that I think the writer needs to, to consider is co coherence in the storyline, purpose for the, the narrative, and a strong theme that'll inform the choices that you have. So if you want to celebrate something, it's probably going to have a, 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 an up ending. If you really want to criticize something, it'll probably have a, a negative ending, you know, uh, like negative irony or something like that, or, or a, a tragic outcome. And then the point is left for the audience to take away, instead of telling us exactly uh, what the story is about or what the message is, we should be able to walk away. Oh man, yeah, that's that's a road to uh, to ruin if you if you let your ego overwhelm your logic and, and reason. So these are are, are, are big things to, to keep in mind. In the creation of a story, as I mentioned earlier, it's all going to come down to your characters. Who are they? What are you trying to say? And then, who, which characters do you need in the story? Ideally, you need two characters, right? You need your protagonist. That's the character that the audience is going to connect with, that we care about, that we're involved with. And then there'll be the antagonist. And the antagonist is has a very strong dramatic function is generally to oppose the protagonist so sometimes you know the the the, the story might be a little more situational but whatever values the protagonist has the antagonist should probably have the opposite values as the case uh, as needs be really i mean there, there's antagonists don't have to be villains either they can be the the virtuous character who's going to be like the mentor and set the protagonist who's off on the wrong path, put them on the straight and narrow. But a lot of your characters that you come up with, it's not just like shoveling a whole bunch of characters into a story going, oh, this will be fun. It's like they need to be informed by choices that you make based on what you're trying to say in this story. One of the examples I use a lot is that, that comedy, um, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. The, what the story's about is, is right in the title. It's about Andy, who's uh, still a virgin at, at 40. So it's a, it's a sex comedy. So that's the theme, really. And it's about relationships and, you know, how everyone has a different perspective. All of the supporting characters in there have different opinions about relationships, because this is what the story's about. And these characters sort of grow out of the theme. They're designed by virtue of you know, the theme, but they're not the same. They're all a little bit different, offering different perspectives, which Andy ultimately has to figure out what his own take, how, how he wants to move ahead with relationships. If this is a story about corporate raiders and it's about greed, you'll have probably a lot of greedy people striving to get ahead, but they'll probably be, by virtue of, you know, some balance in the story, characters who are good, that will affect change, maybe give the protagonist who's like bent on this, well, uh, I think Oliver Stone's Wall Street is a good example of that, right? The, uh, the main character realizes at the end that greed isn't good, that uh, just having a lot of money and, and material possessions doesn't make you a good person. So that's all inherent in where you're going with the, with the story. And then all the characters will, are in the story by virtue of dramatic necessity. So protagonist, obviously, they're going to have a goal that we're all interested in finding out whether they achieve it or not. And somebody to oppose them getting that goal, because that just makes things a little more interesting. And it reveals a lot more about the character and what do they learn and how do they go, uh, ultimately achieve what they're, they're wanting. But then there are ways, you know, certain characters who are introduced to the story because they serve a very specific purpose. And as I mentioned earlier, there are only two ways of getting information out to an audience. And that's what we see and what we hear. 
So if you want an audience to know a little bit of backstory, you have to maybe bring a character in who becomes their sidekick or their buddy or an ally, just a friend, or maybe even a neighbor or a roommate, brother or sister, so that they can ask the questions so that we can hear the answers to make sense of what's going on. And uh, an example I always use, like if there's a character walking down the street and they go into a cafe and they're looking really sad, the question is like, well, who's this character and why are they looking sad? So they go up to the barista and the barista says, oh, hey, Anna, yeah, you're looking uh, the usual. And now right away, we know this is a place where she often goes. And her name is Anna because somebody has said her name. So now we know. But she's looking sad. We don't know why that is yet. So she gets her coffee. She goes to uh, sit in a corner and look and sad. Then the door opens and another character comes in, goes up and goes, oh, hey, hey, Todd, uh, the usual. Yeah. OK, thanks. Gets his coffee, looks around and sees Anna. And it's, you know, just by what we see, it's like, oh, he knows Anna. So he walks over there and sits down. Says, hey, mind if I join you? She goes, no, no. And he goes, OK, hey, you know what? What's going on? You look kind of sad. And now we get the answer, right? To the implied question, why is she looking sad? And so, you know, it might be that, oh, you know, we had a cat and you know how cats like to get into boxes and the cat got into the garage where there was a box and it got into the box and my mom didn't see it when she backed out and now Fluffy is, is flatty. And, um, you know, that's why I'm sad. Now we know. And now that could set up another bit of action where the where Todd says, well, Anna, you know, that's that's just really sad, but maybe, maybe you should get another cat, like a rescue cat. My cousin works at an animal shelter. Why don't I take you there on Saturday and see if you find a cat that would uh, would, would work for you? Now that's a setup, right? Now the expectation is, oh, they're gonna go to the animal shelter. What's going to happen there? Well, maybe the story is evolving into a relationship story that she meets somebody with shared interest in animals. And then the story's, you know, it's already launched. And there are possibilities if you think about this, this causal progression and how it's advanced by this one character who comes in and says, oh, you're looking sad. What are you sad about? The audience knows. And now we have an expectation that they're going to go to the animal shelter. And that is why that other character, why the Todd character is invented and introduced to the story, because they fulfill a purpose of revealing information um, about the situation and the character to the audience. We always have to remember there's an audience, uh, you know, ideally that ideally there will be an audience watching what's going on and wanting to make sense of what's going on and have reasons to appreciate it and, and engage in it. Uh, so yeah, you know, there's work, you know, friends, you know, the, then there's, you know, other maybe whatever the story needs, right? Instead of just putting a whole bunch of characters in, it's like, oh, if I need a character now to, to uh, maybe there's family trouble, I'm going to have to uh, introduce uh, a, a parent or two in that dynamic for whatever reason. But if the reason emerges, then you have to bring a character in. You can't really rely on the muse just to guide your hand, you know, and kind of tell you what the story is about. It, it requires the work and, and the thought. And then the, the process, which I think is, is the most fun. Once you know what you're trying to do, figuring out how to do it is, that's, you know, the, the creative process. And that's where it's a lot of fun. And if you have an understanding of craft, in its simplest form, really, it's like the story needs to go somewhere. Where's it going? And if you don't know where it's going, it's very hard to get there. So that's a lot of things will emerge too. I mean, don't no one's going to write a perfect first draft. And you don't actually have to know at the beginning where you're going, but it should reveal itself to you ultimately based on, well, if I'm here, where, where am I going? And if you don't like where you're going based on where you are, then you have to change where you are. And so stories just evolve. They don't come fully full blown onto the page. Uh, it, it takes a lot of you know, questioning what you've done, questioning if there's a, a better way of, of presenting it. And at the end, you know, you type in fade out and hopefully you've got something that everyone can go, ah, 
you know, that, that made me happy, it made me sad, it gave me insight into maybe a little bit of my own uh, behavior or the behavior of others. And it validates uh, behavior and, and, and perspectives. The, just to quickly wrap up because like, maybe we'll have some, some time for some questions, but it's, I, th I think writing is the way for, for the curious individual to work out stuff for ourselves about what our value systems are and what we want to celebrate and what we want to criticize. And I think sharing that is why stories really matter because it connects us to the, this universal experience that we have as human beings. No matter where we are in, in the world, what cultures we come from, there are these basic things that we all share. Family, you know, life, right? And, and death and work relationships those are those are the the things and that's why i think story is maybe even more important now than, than ever before is just to to share sort of universal truths and and get to a a new perspective that's gonna you know maybe bring people together as opposed to driving them apart um i think that's pretty much what i've got uh for for today uh claudia um, Michael, it's, are you it's around? Excellent. <laughs> it's excellent, Roger. And um, of course, I would like to open, I'm not sure if we can open the microphone because since it's, this is a webinar instead of a, like a regular Zoom meeting. So I'm not sure if we can add the people who are listening as panelists or not, but if possible, we might uh, and Renton, who is in charge uh, of this uh, will will let us know. But also, uh, or if not, they could use the Q&A that we have below to uh, ask their questions. I would love to open the microphone directly to the people. And I just heard there's a girl who was your student, Roger. Carla. And she's here. <laughs> hey, Carla. So, How are you? So uh, probably. Um, Hi. Okay. Probably we could do that. Okay. Yeah, we are here. Okay. Um, I, I do notice in the um, chat here, there's a question. How do you determine your genre or topic based on the economic and cultural environment for a producer to really take your screenplay into account as a profitable one? There are so many scripts that don't make it just because the context in which because of the conflict in which they were pitched, you know, I don't know. That's a that's a toughie. I think sometimes, if like if you want to write an action thriller, you you have to. Well, this is one of the things we do at the, the program. We we study various genres because each genre has specific conventions. So if you're writing a rom com and someone is reading the script expecting a rom-com and it suddenly turns into a slasher movie halfway through, that's going to be a problem, right? That's like, okay, the writer doesn't know what, what he or she's writing. So a lot of times we can put the cart before the horse, I think. Um, I, I, before the genre, just figure out what the story is and then you'll probably become aware of what the genre is. Like, oh, you know, I wanted to write a crime drama, but it's really about a father and, and, and son. It was a family drama. That crime is, a, you know, a part of the plot, but it's not really what the story's about. So I think a lot of times in, in writing, it's just trust yourself as writers to write what you want. I think that'll be the most satisfying instead of writing what you think other people want. And if you do what you do well, it's probably going to be more uh, original and, and fresher than trying to copy something that J.J. Abrams might have written or whoever your, your favorite, Neil Gaiman or whoever your favorite screenwriter is. I think one of the biggest challenges in, in being a writer is being bold to discover your own voice. You know, what do you have to say? Because we're all unique individuals. We all have experience that form our perspective on things. 
and not to be too much of a navel gazer, right? But I think we have to mine our own experiences because that's all we really have that's authentic and organic to our storytelling. And then just, you know, don't put restrictions on yourself at the beginning in terms of genre or, or just discover that in the process. And then you, it evolves and you refine it and go, oh, you know what? I think this is a crime drama. It seems to be going that way. What do I need to make it compelling in that case? You know, there's a lot of really, really great writers out there who write scripts that go nowhere, right? So if you're always working towards an outcome and then, it, it, you know, the script that you spent, you know, two years working on doesn't get made and you didn't enjoy the process because it felt inauthentic because you were trying to write it to please, you know, I think that's the road to resentment and, and bitterness and disappointment. But if you actually enjoy writing, if you enjoy asking questions more than getting answers um, and you write because you have to, you want to, and it satisfies you, then the odds are you, of your scripts being a standout are so much better than somebody who's just, you know, writing derivative uh, stuff, you know, that's just so much like, oh, it's another talking space raccoon or something. It's like, what, what do you really have to say? What's gonna be authentic to you? And that's your own perspective based on your experiences try to keep an open mind also always try to hear other people's points of view and put that in, into your work i think writing is a, is a voyage of self-discovery in in as much as it, it is um just creating product for for the masses you know for entertainment one of my favorite movies in the last little while was um i, I just saw it recently although it's been out for a few years was ladybird I don't know if, if anybody's seen that, but it just felt so real and it was so entertaining and it just felt authentic. And as it turns out, it was largely based on experiences by the writer. And that I think is the, that's what informs all the great work is something authentic uh, from the, the writer themselves. Great, I think we have a question from Guillermo Yanez or Añez. Um, he's he asks he's asking what happens when the story does not have a clear protagonist. It 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 does it won't have focus. It, is uh, you know the our entry into the into the world of the story is through the protagonist. Um, and that's what that's the job is figuring out where you're going with with the protagonist. And then once you figure that out, all the other pieces sort of fall into place because they will be introduced into the story to do two things, to help the character or to hinder the, the character or to reveal necessary information. Um, it Sometimes it takes longer than others to figure out, as even can happen where you write the story and at the end it's like, you thought you knew who the protagonist was, but someone says, oh, I really like your protagonist. And you go, no, that's the antagonist. And you go, oh, okay, wait a minute. Why do you think that's the antagonist? Then, well, they're just more dynamic. And then you start thinking, ah, oh, you know, maybe I need to reconsider. Writers don't always come up with the best uh, ideas right out of the gate. You know, sometimes it takes people to uh, point out obvious flaws or or to question things that one didn't even think needed an answer to so yeah you know i i saw an earlier thing in the about can you turn a first draft into a good final draft and the answer is yes, well, yes abso sir. absolutely because most first drafts are, are crap anyway right it's it's a discovery draft more than anything so then you got to go through it and sift you know, separate the, the good stuff from the, the stuff that's irrelevant to the story and then refine it. Martin Scorsese and Nicholas Pileggi, when they wrote Goodfellas, it was based on a book that Pileggi had written on, about a real guy. And these are two guys at the top of their game, Scorsese and Pileggi. And it took them, I think it was a little over 12 drafts before they went to camera. And these are pros. So, it's, I think it's, 
it's a, it's a huge degree of hubris for a writer to think that their second draft is going to be worthy, you know, that you've actually done all the work that you need to do to make it the best you can. You know, I, I think at the most, a, a first draft is a discovery draft. And that's where you can start to ask questions and discover things that materialized in the script that you weren't even consciously thinking about. Like, you know, someone will go, I really like how you always, at, at, at those moments of high tension, it always seems to be dark and rainy. And so the symbolism there is really awesome. And you're going, what? Is that what? Really? And then you go back and go, oh, yeah, that's right. What was going on there? And I think that's sometimes when you get into that zone, right? And the story is just kind of suggesting itself. And then once you recognize that, you go, that is relevant. That's a key sort of image system. And then you can develop that a little bit more. We don't always know what we're doing. It just takes some time. So sometimes it takes other people to recognize it. And if they point it out to you, you go, oh yeah. The good answer is, oh yeah, I meant to do that. But then it's like, okay, I, I gotta go back and develop that just a little bit more. Um, anything else? Carla? I have one yes. here. Oh, sorry. Hi, hi, Roger. How are hey, you? So, so, sorry, I didn't say anything earlier. I, I, I really felt like in the never ending story movie, like I had no idea you knew I was here. And I had no idea like the panelists, you know, like uh, that they that I, I mentioned earlier, like a week or so uh, ago to Renton, the director that I that I knew you because you were my, my teacher like 11 years ago uh, at BFS. That long ago, wow. Yeah, that long ago. I was there in 2010. Actually, no, 2009, because I came back to Mexico in 2010. So, so when, 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 when you mentioned me right now, I literally felt like, like I was living some, you know, in like some sort of a scene of, of the never, never ending story. I was like, oh, they're talking to me. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just very, very happy to see you. You look the exactly same, uh, besides the beard and the hair, of course, but you look great. I'm, I'm very happy to, oh, to be here. Uh, I'm actually moving to Canada uh, next year. Oh, uh, so yeah, maybe maybe be, we'll we'll have uh, the opportunity to maybe cross paths at some point. Uh, my yeah, my... you know what? Well, uh, once the vaccine, everyone has the vaccine, and uh, life will get back to normal. It'll be nice to get back in the in the classroom and see yeah. real people in the hall and and yeah. get together at Jaegers again. Yes, yes, Roger. I'm, I'm very happy to see you. Um, I, I guess I, I don't have any question. I guess I'm, I'm just wondering what are you working on right now or what have you been up to? Well, I, I've been actually playing a lot of music lately and, and writing a lot of songs. But uh, yeah, still, you know, working on some prose and I've still uh, as an old play that I kind of pick at from time to time. But, you know, teaching... Um, is my main thing, you know. I, like I really, really enjoy talking about the story and, and uh, finding you know, fresh ways of, of of analyzing and assessing and 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 figuring out, you know, figuring out the craft. It's just a, it's an ongoing game, you know. And every every writer, no matter how many things they've written in the past, when they sit down with a new idea, everyone starts on page one, right? Everyone starts at the beginning again. And there's no guarantee just because you wrote something awesome last time that you're going to do it again. But if you enjoy writing, and I don't know, it's it's a cheap thing to do. You know, <laughs> everyone has a computer. It's not like you need a lot of art supplies or anything. And then your imagination. And that's just for me, and it's a good excuse to wander around with my head in the clouds, you know, thinking about things like, well, I mean, there's a, I live on a, on a small island in the, in the Southern Gulf Islands on the, on the coast here. And I'll tell you, this island is full of so many characters that it's, I feel like I've hit the mother load of like story ideas. So I'm, I'm just, I'm still processing a lot, you know? Oh, thank you so much, Roger. I'm, uh... I'm really, I, I swear, I'm really delighted to be here listening to you. You were one of my favorite pro professors. I think you're a, gr a great teacher and a oh, great uh, person. Nice. And and thank you so much for remembering me. I had no idea you would you would you know remember well, me. Well, I, 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 you've been all over the world lately. 
<laughs> yes, yes, I travel lots, and I think it helps with storytelling because you, 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 you meet a lot of very interesting people in a lot of different uh, interesting cultures. So I think it it brings a lot of uh, uh, I don't know ideas and insight on 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 how people live in different parts of the world. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one of my my hobbies to travel around and my 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 soon-to-be husband he's he's Canadian actually uh-huh. and, and he's also a screenwriter director producer so we enjoy the same things and it's it, it has uh, um, brought a lot of uh, I don't know I guess creativity uh, onto our storytelling with with the traveling so yeah yes well great well if you get up into Vancouver again and you know the everything calms down you get in yeah. touch and uh, come and see us i would love to i swear i would love to i think we are uh we're connected on facebook i don't know if you use facebook i guess you do because you know i was traveling yeah so yeah. so of course i will i will let you know where where i'm gonna be living in vancouver but i'm gonna i'm gonna let you know when i'm okay. uh, i mean in vancouver in calgary but i'm gonna let you know when i'm in vancouver thank you roger you're welcome yeah thanks uh okay. Roger. Yo. What did I miss? <laughs> Everything. Everything. Well, that was my plan. No, I knew I left people in capable hands, and this was this was your jam. This is my uh, drum solo, right? It was your drum solo. Everything went well? Yeah, I think just covering sort of basic nuts and bolts, you know, like just kind of developing a little more what you were saying is, you know, what do we have to say for ourselves? You know, unless you want to write commercials, you have to have an opinion and you have to have something to say and something that you feel is worthwhile saying. And I'm, and I'm sure you mentioned the responsibility of being a writer, because we get to we get to change people's minds. I, I, I hopefully alluded to that. <laughs> I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. Anyway, I'm sorry I, I was I was um, otherwise occupied, but um, no I'm worries. back. Are we wrapping this up or are we continuing with questions? No, I, I, well, it, Claudia, it's uh, it's noon. I'm 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 pretty much said everything I had prepared or thought about. Okay. Well, does anybody have any questions about the program that we have at the Vancouver Film School? Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I'm glad we had this opportunity to reach out and speak to you guys in Mexico and, and, and to talk a little bit about screenwriting, though Roger did all the talking. But um, that's the privilege of being the head of the program. I don't have to do anything. I just tell people to do things. Anyway, it's great. Roger, thank you very much. No, my pleasure. There's just one quick, it looks like there's a last question here. As a storyteller, what should you develop first? form in as in exposition or structure as in conflict i think it all you know so many people so many opinions i think it all begins with a character yeah. You know? yeah it always begins with that and what are you what are you trying to say and yeah yeah it's it's, it's really simple stuff it 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 it, it, it is not um, rocket science it's it's just really as i said earlier giving yourself permission to be creative well, here's another quick question, Baze, and maybe you can, uh, what benefits can you mention about studying at Vancouver Film School? Well, I have enormous benefits. You get to meet Roger. Um, in, in, in but, but among other, but besides meeting Roger, we have an incredible faculty. Um, Roger's actually, to show you how good our faculty is, Roger's actually our worst teacher. And that just gives you an idea of how good our teachers are. Um, we have a great faculty of dedicated professionals and everybody in the program who teaches actually didn't go to university. This is what sets us apart. Most schools, most writing programs employ writers to teach, but they employ writers to teach who went to school to learn how to teach and learn how to write. Our instructors actually all learned their craft from being in the industry. So we're very proud of that. Um, one of the other great benefits is that we're a small program. You know, our program maxes out at just 32 writers per intake. We have three intakes a year. So that's only 
At any given time, we have 96 students, but in each class there's only 32. And we break down into very small groups of five and six into workshopping. So you get a lot of hands-on. Most programs, and it's very cost, it's very expensive to do that for us, okay? And so most universities and colleges don't do as much workshopping as we do because you can't workshop a big class. You gotta break the classes into small groups. And that means more teachers and more teaching hours. So we, 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 we do that, which I think sets us apart. Um, our philosophy though, I think is what really sets us apart, which is we don't talk about it, right? We, we were more practical, we do it. So for the first term, it's a one year program, it's very intense. And that's another aspect that's really, I think worth mentioning is that I feel that after a year of, of a writing program, we've taught you everything you need to know to go out there and do it. Otherwise we think you're treading water. So we only really hit the important points of, of what screenwriting is, the, the really salient points of what it takes to be a writer and what it takes to be a writer in the industry since we're all from the industry. Um, so we're this very intense one year program where we have the students leave with a body of work, uh, a, a portfolio, so to speak, that is designed to open doors. And that's the key phrase here is to open doors because you don't get a job in this business. And I'm assuming anybody who comes to a film school, any film school is considering a career in the entertainment business. Okay. And you don't get a job in the entertainment business unless you can prove to somebody that you can deliver, okay? And so what I think we do better than most programs, if I could be so immodest, is that I think we prepare our students to deliver. So when our students leave, they have a strong body of work, a large body of work of full length screenplays, of television episodes, of pilots, of short films, of, of, of sketch comedy. They leave here with this, this quiver, so to speak, full of these, um, these arrows that are hopefully gonna be aimed towards the industry that we will get in somebody's desk and someone will say the magic words. And the magic words are, come in, let's talk. You know, And that's what you wanna do. You need to get your foot in the door. And I think we prepare our students really well to help them get their foot in the door. And that's it. So I think we have a really strong program. There are other programs out there and I'm sure they're fine. Um, I think we have a unique program. Roger, you what want to the, add to that? What are the additional benefits, I think, even online, is this, you you tap into a community of like-minded people and that kind of becomes your, your network. You know, you meet uh, other people that you can bounce ideas off. You can form like writer groups after you graduate. And then, you know, if someone's got, they, they learn about something, they can pass it on. So the, the networking is, is I think, a, a big added benefit. Um, even online, it, like I just know with our last intake, you know, there, there's a, there's, they seem comfortable and they like each other. And um, yeah, that's gonna be kind of their network as they move forward. Yeah. And, and in, I, in the writing, you, you also get in touch with, you know, other aspiring directors and aspiring writers or aspiring actors and all of that. So that's a, it's a great resource. It's true. We have 13 different programs at the school and every of the programs, be it the acting program, the film production program, which by the way, I'm also the head of. So we get to get our writers and the film students together much more than they used to before I was the head of both programs. Um, but we have these 13 programs and each program is a resource for each other program. So the students of each program are resources for the students of the other programs. And it, and it works out really well. It also bears mentioning, and I don't wanna hog the microphone here, but, 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 but it bears mentioning that our, our, our student body is profoundly international. You know, we make the joke sometimes in Vancouver Film School that Spanish should be our second language because we have so many students from Mexico and Central America and South America. Um, it's, it's a remarkable thing. We have students from China, from India, from France, from England, from Turkey. I mean, we, have, we had a student recently from Kazakhstan. I don't know where he came from, but somehow we got a student from Kazakhstan. It's an amazing thing, right? And, and so there's this wonderful exchanging, not only of ideas, but of cultural ideas, right? And different, different ways of telling stories. Of course, culture, stories sometimes are told culturally differently. 
right? And, and, and it's really a fascinating thing to do. So anyway, we have a nice program. There are other programs out there, but um, I'm the head of this one and I think we do a good job. <laughs>